All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Lee Arnold, and welcome to uh, day three of our funding tour, uh, as well as He's the Solution Ministries, uh, which is something that we've been doing as a company. Um, actually, it's a ministry that my wife and I started back in October of 2009. And um, we have church services every Sunday morning, uh, wherever we are. So if we are at an event uh, at some city, some hotel, somewhere in the country, uh, we'll have church services there. Uh, but we also have them every Sunday morning uh, at 6.45 a.m. Pacific, where uh, we start with a time of prayer, uh, and then we have our Bible study, and we take one verse out of the Bible. Uh, and we talk about it. Uh, second, uh, we'll be in Second Samuel chapter fourteen this morning. Uh, but this is something that the Lord placed on my heart, uh, just because I've been uh, traveling for about twenty years and on the road um, doing seminars. And for the first ten years of that, we didn't have church at any of our events. So here I was, a Christian, um, teaching people how to get rich in real estate, uh, how to get rich, you know, in 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 man's world, uh, but I was taking people away from their spiritual life, and uh, uh, I was convicted by that. So uh, in October of 2009, my wife and I started He's a Solution Ministries, uh, and we've been uh, doing it ever since. Uh, you can go to our website, he's the solution.com and uh, read up more about that, but at our events, uh, we like to give people out a Bible, so if there's anybody uh, watching from home that would like a Bible, we'd happily send one out to you. Uh, I feel like everybody needs to have a good Bible. Uh, and as you can see, this one's got really big print. Uh, the older I get, the more I appreciate the large font because uh, it makes it a little bit easier to read. Uh, we've given away now thousands of Bibles all over the country, uh, and we just share Christ. Uh, we give out bookmarks that are from uh, some of our uh, longtime friends of the ministry, as well as for those that do accept Christ as their Lord and Savior when we're out there on the road, uh, we will send them this 14-day devotional uh, for new believers called A New Life. Uh, and then uh, also, uh, you guys can download, is this on the um, download? Yeah, if you guys uh, just go down below the chat, those of you on the phone with me here, you uh, won't be able to see this, but for those of you that are live streaming from home right now, you can download uh, our Welcome to Worship pamphlet, uh, and in here you can read more about the ministry, uh, how it started, kind of the foundation of it, and um, all the fun things there, as well as the dial-in information uh, if you want to join us uh, Sunday mornings. Uh, also, you can go to our Facebook page at He's the Solution and uh, just like that page. And when you do that, uh, you will receive a notification when we go live because we do uh, do Facebook Live every Sunday morning as well as the phone call. The phone call. So we want to uh, give as many opportunities through as many different media and channels as possible uh, because my heart is to share the word. My heart is to help people spiritually. Um, you know, there's no sense making a bunch of money and learning how to get rich in real estate if you don't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's more important than anything. Uh, I think that wealth creation, all of those things come after uh, we get our heart right with the Lord. And, and I think that there has to be the proper alignment. Uh, my wife, uh, spent some time with the Mary Kay organization years ago, and their motto was God first, family second, career third. And I'm sure you've heard that before. God first, family second, career third. Uh, so that's how uh, I try to live my life as well. Uh, also, uh, want to invite you all out here to beautiful Coeur d'Alene uh, on October 23, 24, and 25, uh, right here at the Coeur d'Alene Resort. We will be having the Be Bold for Jesus conference. Uh, and we have Kirk Cameron coming out as our keynote speaker, uh, as well as a bunch of other uh, godly men, business leaders um, that are using their business to be bold for Jesus. Um, so you can learn more about that at Be Bold for Jesus or I'm Bold for Jesus dot org. Uh, we'd love to have you all join us for that as well. All right. So this morning, 
Uh, we are in 2 Samuel chapter 14, so if you would please open up your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 14, and we will read through it together, uh, and then we'll uh, talk about it. So 2 Samuel chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Joab, son of Zariah, knew that the king's heart longed for Absalom. So Joab sent someone to Tekoa, and a wise woman brought from there. He said to her, pretend you are in mourning, dress in mourning clothes, and don't use any cosmetic lotions. Act like a woman who has spent many days grieving for the dead. Then go to the king and speak these words to him. And Joab put the words in her mouth. And when the woman from Tekoa went to the king, she fell with her face to the ground to pay him honor. And she said, help me, O king. And the king asked her, what is troubling you? She said, I am indeed a widow. My husband is dead. I, your servant, had two sons, and they got into a fight with each other in the field, and no one was there to separate them, and one struck the other and killed him. Now the whole clan has risen up against your servant, and they say, hand over the one who struck his brother down so that we may put him to death for the life of his brother whom he killed. Then we will get rid of the heir as well. They would put him out. They would put out the only burning coal I have left, leaving my husband neither name nor descendant. On the face of the earth and the king said to the woman go home and i will issue an order in your behalf but the woman from tekoa said to him my lord the king let the blame rest on me and my father's family and let the king and his throne be without guilt the king replied if anyone says anything to you bring him to me and he will not bother you again and she said then let the king invoke the lord his god to prevent the avenger of blood from adding to the destruction so that my son will not be destroyed. As surely as the Lord lives, he said, not one hair of your son's head will fall to the ground. And then the woman said, let your servant speak a word to my Lord, the king. Speak, she replied, he replied. And the woman said, why then have you devised a thing like this against the people of God? When the king says this, does he not convict himself? For the king has not brought back his banished son, like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be recovered. So we must die, but God does not take away life. Instead, he devises ways so that a banished person may not remain estranged from him. Verse 15, and now I've come to say this to my Lord, the king, because the people have made me afraid. Your servant thought, I will speak to the king. Perhaps he will do what his servant asks. Perhaps the king will agree to deliver his servant from the hand of the man who is trying to cut off both me and my son from the inheritance God gave us. And now your servant says, may the word of the Lord, the king, bring me rest. For my Lord, the king, is like an angel of God in discerning good and evil. May the Lord, your God, be with you. Then the king said to the woman, do not keep. Then the Lord God said to the woman, do not keep from me the answer to what I'm going to ask you. Let my lord the king speak, the woman said. And the king asked, isn't the hand of Joab with you in all of this? And the woman answered, as surely as you live, my lord the king, no one can turn to the right or to the left from anything my lord the king says. Yes, it was your servant Job who instructed me to do this and who put all these words into the mouth of your servant. Your servant Job did this to change the present situation. My Lord has wisdom like that of an angel of God. He knows everything that happens in the land. The king said to Job, very well, we'll do it. Go bring back the young man Absalom. So Job fell with his face to the ground to pay him honor, and he blessed the king. And Job said, today your servant knows that he has found favor in your eyes, my Lord, the king, because the king has granted his servant's request. Then Joab went to Geshur and brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. But the king said, he must go on his own house. He must not see my face. So Absalom went to his own house, and he did not see the face of the king. In all Israel, there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the top of his head to the sole of his foot, there was no blemish in him. Whenever he cut the hair of his head, he used to cut his hair from time to time. When it became too heavy for him, he would weigh it and its weight was 200 shekels by the royal standard. Verse 27, again, we're in 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 27. Three sons and a daughter were born to Absalom. The daughter's name was Tamar, and she became a beautiful woman. And Absalom lived two years in Jerusalem without seeing the king's face. 
Then Absalom sent for Joab in order to send him to the king, but Joab refused to come to him. So he sent a second time, but he refused to come. Then he said to his servants, look, Joab's field is next to mine and he has barley there, go and set it on fire. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. And then Joab did go to Absalom's house and he said to him, why have your servants set my field on fire? And Absalom said to Joab, look, I sent word to you and said, come here so I can send you to the king to ask, why have I come from Geshur? It would be better for me if I were still there. Now then, I want to see the king's face. And if I'm guilty of anything, let him put me to death. So Joab went to the king and told him this. Then the king summoned Absalom and he came in and bowed down with his face to the ground before the king and the king kissed Absalom. Let's pray. Lord, we just come to you this morning, uh, Lord, Palm Sunday. Uh, Lord, as we now go into uh, the week that you spent, Lord, being, being accused and being tortured and, Lord, being crucified. Lord, as we think about that sacrifice, as we think about your willingness to die for each and every one of us, to forgive us for our sins, and to give us a way, Lord, that we could be done with condemnation, Lord, and be done with feeling like we're not good enough, to be done with feeling like we can never measure up. Lord, that's this week. So, Lord, help us all to just be in thought and prayer as we are reminded as we come to Friday, Lord, the day of your crucifixion. And Lord, as we look forward to next Sunday, a week from today, the day of your resurrection, Lord, we serve a risen king. Help us to not forget that, Lord. Help us to be continually reminded that you are on the throne. And Lord, in the midst of all this craziness with coronavirus and stay in place, stay home, Lord, we are as a nation, as a world, Lord, we are stopped. All of the trappings, Lord, that we, we relied on from jobs to relationships to being able to go to the movies, Lord, stopped. And Lord, what an opportunity it is to just be calm and to be still and to be reminded that you are on the throne. Lord, many people confused during this time, many people unemployed, Lord, many people furloughed and, and, and worried about being laid off. Uh, Lord, so many difficult, painful situations that people are experiencing this morning. Lord, I pray that you would just give them all peace and comfort. And Lord, while you may not give them a job tomorrow or help them win the lottery tomorrow, Lord, we know that in all things you are in control. So help us to never lose sight of that. Lord, help us to take our confidence from you and from no one else. Lord, I pray now that as we look at your word, as we uh, just go through 2 Samuel chapter 14, Lord, that you would speak to each and every one of us. Lord, we know that you speak to us through your word. We know that your word is alive. And Lord, this is how you talk to us. So Lord, I pray that you would Soften our hearts, Lord. Help us to uh, block out all of the worry and the concern and the fear that we are currently experiencing, Lord. And help us to just find peace in this moment as we sit at your feet and we listen to your word. Lord, help me to get out of the way. Nobody cares what I have to say, Lord. We want to hear from you. So open up our hearts. Help us to be receptive. Speak to us. Lord, we ask you these things now, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Absalom returns to Jerusalem. Absalom has been alienated. Absalom has recently killed his brother. As we're coming here into chapter 14, we are now three years removed from where we were in chapter 13. So if you just hang a left in your Bible, uh, verse 23, we see two years later. So two years later than what? Two years 
from the time that Amnon, who is Absalom's older brother, uh, rapes his half-sister Tamar, which is Absalom's full sister, uh, and he's upset, he's angry, because his father, the king, King David, did not reprimand his son, he did not correct his son, he did not punish his son. His son rapes his sister, and David does nothing. Now, Amnon being the oldest, he's next in line to be king. So was he given immunity simply because he was next in line to be king? No. We see throughout David that he struggled as a father to punish his children, to correct his children, to keep them in line. Now, granted, David was a busy guy, so... There's an argument to be made. Well, you know, he was so busy. He had all these servants, you know. Why didn't why didn't his wives do it? Why, why didn't the moms take care of discipline? Well, because the Bible says that it's the father's responsibility to discipline and correct the children. And when we go outside of what God has called us to do, that's when chaos ensues. And unfortunately for David, chaos is ensuing. Right under his own reign, right in his own home. His son is raping his daughter. His next oldest son, Absalom, Amnon's younger brother, younger half-brother, is plotting his murder. And two years later now, we see in chapter 13 where Absalom is going to kill his brother Amnon. And then he's going to flee to the land of Gesher, which is about 80 miles from Jerusalem. He's going to flee to Gesher. Uh, where he was, where his mother is from, so he goes and he lives with his grandparents, who are also uh, king and queen of that land. So Absalom has kingship on both sides. He is the he is the grandson of the king, and he is the direct son of the king and the princess of Gesher. So Absalom is kind of this. Pretty boy, arrogant, do whatever he wants, gets away with everything kind of a guy. And he's now been in Gesher for three years because he killed his brother and he ran, he fled. Now, King David up to this point has done nothing to punish his son. No communication, uh, no corrective discipline, nothing. The sin takes place. Absalom runs away. And for King David... Business as usual. Now, King David's direct in charge, the, the, the man in charge of his army, Joab, knows that King David longs for his son Absalom. Joab knew the king very well and recognized the signs of David yearning for his exiled son as head of the army. Joab was concerned that Israel have a crown prince ready to reign, just in case something happened to David. Now, at this time in the story, David is almost 60 years of age, and he's, he's getting up in years. He's not as spry as he used to be. We know that David was a mighty warrior. Uh, we know that David conquered many, many lands. We know that David was God's chosen to be king after Solomon. Uh, and for those of you that have been along for the ride with us in, in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, we see that David was just a, an incredibly godly man, and he was an incredible warrior. But we saw in chapter 11 where David had an affair with Bathsheba. And that's where this whole thing starts going downhill, because David has an affair with a married woman, gets her pregnant, uh, and then in an attempt to cover it up, tries to get his her husband to come back from battle so he can sleep with her, uh, and then they can point to him and say, well, it's his baby, not my baby. But him being more honorable than David, he is unwilling to go sleep with his wife because they're in the middle of the war, and he says, it would be wrong for me to go enjoy my wife when all of my brethren are out fighting a battle. So he refuses to go be with his wife. So David says, okay, well, if I'm not going to be able, able to cover it up that way, then I guess I'm going to have to kill him. So he goes to his men in the field and he says, hey, uh, make sure that her husband Uriah doesn't come back alive. And sure enough, Uriah gets killed on the battlefield. Bathsheba mourns. A few days later, she's now living in David's home as his new wife. 
So up to chapter 11, David was um, really honoring the Lord, and the Lord was blessing David. But in chapter 11, David decides that he's going to go to his own thing. Now, David is 50 years old when he has the affair with Bathsheba. So when we go from chapter 11 at 50 years of age to chapter 14 at 60 years of age, 10 years now have transpired. And in this time, uh, he's lost his son, uh, his oldest son, Amnon, uh, and he's getting up in years. So Joab is sitting here going, okay, David's getting old. Who's going to be king when he's gone? We need to get the next in line here in Jerusalem so we can start preparing him to be king. And that next in line to be king would be Absalom. Now, we will find later that Absalom is not God's choice to be king, and it will actually be David and Bathsheba's younger son, Solomon, who will become king of Israel. But Am Absalom certainly doesn't know this, and of course King David at this point doesn't know this. Uh, and we're going to see now through this chapter that this is really going to be the, the launch pad of Absalom's disdain for his father, uh, his unwillingness to do what his dad says, and really just his, his desire to take over uh, by force and push his dad out. And it all starts from David's sin. Now, it should, be noted, it should be noted that at this point, God has forgiven David. God is very forgiven. When we cry out to him and we say, Lord, forgive me, I've sinned, he says, you're forgiven. So David's been forgiven. So understand that this isn't happening because God's mad at David. David's been forgiven. But this is happening because when we step out of line, when we do not do what God calls us to do, there's punishment, there's there's retribution. There are things that happen. Now, that doesn't mean that we should follow God and, and do what he asks us to do because we're afraid of what happens if we don't. No, no, no. We should follow the Lord because he sent his son to die on the cross because he loves us. And it's through Christ's death and resurrection on the cross that we get to spend an eternity in heaven. That's worth celebrating, and I want to follow God, and I want to be the best version of myself that I can be, not because I have to, not because my salvation depends on me being a good person or doing good things. No, my salvation is in Christ. But unfortunately, sometimes we forget that, don't we? And we think, well, Lord, I've been a good person. Lord, I've done everything you've asked me to do. How come you're not blessing me? You know, some people actually believe that uh, in the midst of this COVID pandemic that they're personally being punished. You know, I can tell you that I believe that in many respects, God is getting our attention with coronavirus. Because as a nation, what do, what do we celebrate? We celebrate wealth and we celebrate success while all the businesses are closed. As a nation, we celebrate Superheroes, we celebrate basketball stars, we celebrate college basketball, we celebrate football, we celebrate hockey players, we celebrate golfers. All sports are canceled. I do believe that God is using coronavirus for us as a nation to stop and go, where is the Lord in my life? Where is the Lord in my business? Where is the Lord in my family? Am I being the best version of myself I can be? Or have I allowed all of the busyness of life to keep me from being who God's called me to be? From being the, the husband, the father, the dad that God wants me to be? So we can look at all of the things that God's taken away through coronavirus, or we can look at all of the things that God has blessed us with through coronavirus. And I'll tell you this, we are blessed beyond measure. If you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you are blessed beyond measure. Even if you've been laid off, even if money is tight or, or non-existent, you've been blessed beyond measure. And we need not worry. The Bible says, don't worry about what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will wear. The birds of the field, don't worry and look at them. Why should we worry? So, as much as there is to point at the coronavirus and say, this is terrible, this sucks, I hate this, 
you know, there's an argument to be made that many of you wouldn't be watching right now without coronavirus. It could be that God brought coronavirus specifically because he needs you to hear this message this morning. And if you lose everything through this COVID-19 pandemic, but as a result of being rid of all of those trappings of success, you find Jesus and you have a personal relationship with him as a result of this virus, then praise the Lord. I hope that we as a nation reconnect with God through this. I hope that we as a nation are crying out to God and say, God, why? What's going on, God? And we turn over our lives to him. We give him control of everything that's going on. And we stop trying to do everything ourselves. Because when we try to do everything ourselves in the absence of God, that's when things get out of control. That's when things get scary. That's when we begin to worry. Now, in our story, David loved his son undoubtedly. But he was convicted about the way he had pampered him. David didn't correct Absalom like he should have. David was not the father that he should have been. He was not the spiritual leader in his home. He was an amazing warrior. He was an amazing business person. But he was not the spiritual leader that he should have been in his home. So Joab, looking at this and saying, hey, you know what? The people need a king. The people need somebody that they can point to and say, that's the one in charge. Go talk to that person. And so Joab is saying, we need to restore David and Absalom's relationship. So he comes up with this plan. And he finds this woman from Tekoa. Now, Tekoa is a small little village. It's about 14 miles south of Jerusalem, where David is located. And he brings this woman, and he says to her, Pretend that you are in mourning, verse 2, dress in mourning clothes, M-O-U-R, mourning as in I'm crying, I'm distraught. Dress in mourning clothes and don't use any cosmetic lotions. Act like a woman who spent many days grieving for the dead. Then go to the king and speak words to him. And Joab put these words in her mouth. Now here David is about to fall for another story. Turn back to chapter 12 with me real quick. Chapter 12, David has committed his sin with Bathsheba. He's covered it up, and he believes that he's gotten away with it. And the prophet Nathan comes to David, and he says, uh, chapter one, of, verse 1 of chapter 12, he said, The Lord sent Nathan to David when he came to him, and he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, he had bought and he raised it and he grew up with it and his children had shared his food drank from his cup and even slept in his arms it was like a daughter to him now a traveler came to the rich man but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him instead he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him and david burned with anger against the man and he said to nathan as surely as the lord lives the man who did this deserves to die he must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Now, as the king, David is the judge. So David is the, the only sitting member of the Supreme Court. And when there is a issue, it is brought before the king. Now, in Exodus, we see where Moses sets up judges 
to manage the affairs of the people. And if the judges can't keep everything in order, then it will escalate up, similar to our court system today. But here, uh, it is brought to him, Nathan brings it to David, and he says, hey, this just happened, what, what, what's your ruling? And he says, you gotta kill that guy. And your eyes, or, or Nathan says, well, you're the guy. So now here in chapter 14, we're going to see David presented now with another supposed issue that he needs to rule on because he has been putting it off, putting off the reconciliation of his son. So Joab, in an effort to reveal David, once again, David's sin, David's unwillingness to deal with the issue, he hires this woman to come in and, and act like she's distraught, like her son has recently died. So Joab manages to get an audience with David in front of this woman, or this woman in front of David. And she comes to David. Verse 5, and David says, what is troubling you? And she said, I am indeed a widow. My husband is dead. I, your servant, had two sons, and they got into a fight with each other in the field, and no one was there to separate them. I, your servant, uh, no one was there to separate them. One struck the other and killed him. Now the whole clan has risen up against your servant, and they say, hand over the one who struck his brother down. so that we may put him to death for the life of his brother whom he killed. Then we will get rid of the heir as well, and they would put out the only burning coal I have left, leaving my husband neither name nor descendant on the face of the earth. Now, since this woman is a widow, now in the story, which is false, this is not a true story, she's making all of this up, but in this story, she's saying, my two sons were out in the field, and one of them killed the other. My husband is dead, and now everybody wants to kill the brother who's still alive because he is guilty of murder. The issue here is, if they kill my only remaining son, then I have no livelihood. So the law existed specifically to keep this from happening. There's no welfare system. There's no food stamps. There's no Social Security so a woman's retirement, a woman's well-being was tied to her family, starting with her husband and then her sons. And if her sons are both dead and her husband's dead, then this renders this woman in a very, very bad situation. She will not have any family. She will not have any heirs. And this is a big problem. So if the death penalty for murder was in, invoked, there would be no living heir in the family, leaving that family with no future a situation the law sought to avoid. Joab got her to play upon the feelings of David by telling him her sad story. Just as David had used deception in the attempt to cover up his sin with Bathsheba, he was now being deceived. What goes around comes around. So David deceived Uriah, and now he is being deceived by Joab and this woman. Verse 8, so David is hearing this, and he says to the woman, go home. I'll issue an order on your behalf. David says, I'll take care of it. But the woman from Tekoa said to him, my lord, the king, let the blame rest on me and my father's family and let the king and his throne be without guilt. The woman says, I know you're bending the rules on this matter, the woman said, but I'll take responsibility. The woman was willing to receive whatever blame might arise from the sparing of her guilty son. But David assures her, verse 10, if anyone says anything to you, bring him to me, and he will not bother you again. David essentially says, as surely as the Lord lives, not one hair of your son's head or hair will fall to the ground. She says, verse 11, then let the king invoke the Lord his God to prevent the avenger of blood from adding to the destruction so that my son will not be destroyed. As surely as the Lord lives, he said, not one hair of your son's head will fall to the ground. Now, the avenger of blood, the law provided for a way to avenge murder in Numbers chapter 35, verses 9 through 21, records how cities of refuge protected people from revenge and how blood avengers were to pursue murderers. 
This woman was asking for the king's protection against her claim against her entire family. And so David grants her imaginary son a full pardon. He says, look, your son's a murderer. I get it. But if he gets killed, you're in a bad situation. So I'm going to forgive the murder of your son to the other. Verse 12. Then the woman says, let your servant speak a word to my lord, the king. Hey, David, king, do you mind if I chat with you for a moment? I mean, the woman now knows that she literally has David in a corner. If he had agreed to protect a guilty son whom he did not know, how much more was he obligated to protect his own son whom he loved? Now, remember, David's son Amnon was killed by his other son Absalom. So here it's a parallel situation, and David isn't, it's not tracking. He's not getting it. He's going, yes, your son is forgiven. He murdered somebody that was terrible, but I issue him full pardon. He's forgiven. And the woman says, King, <laughs> can, I get a, can I get a minute? David says, speak, verse 13. And the woman said, why then have you devised a thing like this against the people of God? When the king says this, does he not convict himself? For the king has not brought, brought back his banished son. Like water spilled on the ground cannot be recovered, so we must die. But God does not take away life. Instead, he devises ways so that a banished person may not remain estranged from him. This woman had come to David with a matter involving the future of one small family. But the matter concerning Absalom concerned the future of an entire nation. The king didn't want to see her only son and heir destroyed, but he was willing for the crown prince, Absalom, who's been left in exile three years. David has had no contact with his child, none. Absalom ran to Geshur, and David's, David writes him off, and he says, see you later, dude. So here in the story, he's saying, I will forgive the murder of your son, but he could not forgive the man who plotted the murder of Amnon. So her question is, how much longer will the king wait before he sends for his son? After all, life is brief, and when life ends, it's like water spilled into the earth and can't be recovered. Slaying the murderer can't bring back the victim. So why not give him another chance? Now, as I was going through this, I started thinking, how many of us have been harboring resentment or ill will towards a friend, a family member, a spouse who messed up? They screwed up. They sinned. And they sinned against you. They, they wronged you. And it, it, it was incredibly painful, and you still have ill will towards them. It can, be a, it can be a son, it can be a daughter, it can be a brother or sister, an aunt, an uncle, a co-worker. As Christians, we are not called to harbor resentment towards anybody. And what this woman is saying is she's saying, wait a minute, you can forgive everyone else who have wronged you, but you can't forgive your son? You can't forgive your daughter? You can't forgive your brother? You can't forgive your sister? And this woman is, is calling David out on his hypocrisy. So on the one hand, it's fine if it happens over here, but when it affects you directly, the rules change? Now, when she says against the people of God, the woman is asserting that by allowing Absalom to remain in exile, David has jeopardized the future welfare of Israel because if he doesn't bring Absalom back, who's going to be the king? And we all know that they need a king. So if he would be so generous to a son he did not know, in a family he did not know, 
Why would he not forgive his own son? The woman's essentially saying, David, you're a hypocrite. For you have allowed mercy to be extended to my son, but you have withheld it from your own. Verse 15. And now I have come to say this to my Lord the King, because the people have made me afraid. Your servant thought, I will speak to the king. Perhaps he will do what his servant asks. Perhaps the king will agree to deliver his servant from the hand of the man who is trying to cut off both me and my son from the inheritance that God gave us. And now, your servant says, may the word of my lord the king bring me rest, for my lord the king is like an angel of God in discerning good and evil. May the lord your God be with you. Now, at this point, she is guilty of overacting, right? Now she's really buttering David up, and she's saying, hey, you're the king, and your words are like the words of an angel. And whatever you say is absolutely the way things are. Verse 17, may the word of my Lord the King bring me rest. For my Lord the King is like an angel of God in discerning good and evil. She just got a little too buttery here. And she says in verse 18, do not keep from me the answer to what I am going to ask you. Let my Lord the King speak, the woman said. And the king asked, isn't the hand of Joab with you in all this? Did Joab put you up to this? Because this is starting to sound a little fishy is what David is saying. So did Joab put you up to this? Verse 19, and the woman answered, As surely as you live, my lord and king, no one can turn to the right or to the left from anything, my lord the king says. Yet it was your servant Joab who instructed me to do this and who put all these words in the mouth of your servant. Yes, David, your, your commander of the armies put me up to this. But why did Joab put her up to this? It's because Joab is committed to restoring Absalom to David. Now, it could also be that Joab himself has a personal motivation here, because if another king comes in, Joab's going to be without a job, and Joab's probably going to get murdered. So this is all about keeping his job. And, and, and so he's, he's trying to politic his way to getting Absalom back, restoring the relationship with Absalom and David, so that when Absalom becomes king and David's out, Joab might still have a job. Boy, does that sound like the politicking that goes on in today's world? This happens all the time. I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job, so I'm going to saddle up to the king, and I'm going to make myself indispensable so that it, it, if leadership changes or roles change, I, I'm indispensable. They can't, they can't do it without me, so I'm going to do everything I can to harbor everything so that in the event that they get rid of me, the, the whole thing falls apart. So that's essentially what Joab is doing here. Verse 20. Your servant Job did this to change the present situation. This is still the woman. She says, my Lord has wisdom like an angel of God. He knows everything that happens in the land. And the king said to Joab. So Joab's been sitting over here, probably, you know, behind a pillar, just kind of listening to this whole scene unfold. And clearly he's in the same room because David addresses him immediately. He says, the king said to Job, verse 21, very well, I will do it. Go bring back the young man, Absalom. So David says, you know what? You're right. How can I forgive this other murderer who I do not know, but yet I can't forgive my own son? Now, how do we how do we how do we use this? How do we how do we gather and gain and glean instruction from this? Well, it's pretty simple. If you don't forgive everyone equally, then you don't forgive the way God forgives us. God does not forgive in increments. And God does not say, well, that sin was greater than this one. So, you know, for me to forgive that sin, I'm going to need 29 Hail Marys. I'm going to need you at church every Wednesday and Sunday. And I'm going to need you to tithe 15%, not 10%. Now, can you imagine if we served a God who ruled and reigned like that? 
Now, you're laughing because the very thought of it seems ludicrous, doesn't it? But there are religions today that say if you don't do things a certain way, that you are going to go to a different level of heaven, or you're not going to have all of God's favor, or that the inheritance from father to son is going to be reduced because you're much more sinful than that guy over there. That's not the God we serve. The God we serve is equal. And if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and you call him Lord and Savior and King, he doesn't care if you stole a piece of gum from the grocery store or if you murdered somebody. It's all sin. And when we accept Jesus into our heart and we say, Lord, I want you to be the Lord of my life, he comes in and he forgives us for all of our sins. And he cleanses us. Now, a lot of people struggle with that because that, that doesn't make any sense. Well, understand that God's ways are not man's ways. And man's ways are the more egregious the sin, the more, the more painful the forgiveness. We do not serve a God who requires us to earn our salvation. The Bible says, not of works, lest any man should boast. You cannot earn your way to heaven. It doesn't matter if you show up at church faithfully. It doesn't matter if you tithe 10% faithfully. It doesn't matter if you go on a mission trip. None of that matters. There's nothing in the Bible that says you must do the following things to get salvation or you go to hell. It doesn't say that. It simply says, if you don't accept and receive Christ into your heart and make him your Lord and Savior, you'll go to hell. That's what the Bible says. Now, once you accept him as Lord and Savior, you become an adopted child of God. And an adopted child gets treated the same way as all of the other kids. And we know that the Jewish nation is God's chosen people. And as Gentiles, those of us that are not Jews, we are the adopted sons of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. That's why Jesus died on the cross, so that all of us could have an opportunity to go to heaven and spend an eternity with him there. If you have been following a gospel other than this one, it is a lie. Because God does not require performance for salvation. God does not require us to go work and be good. If you have Jesus Christ living in your heart, you are good and kind and thoughtful and loving and caring because how can you be that close with Jesus and be anything else? We are not good because we have to be. We are good because we want to be. So David says, go get him, Joab. Bring him back. So, verse 23, Joab goes to Geshur, and he gets Absalom, brings him back to Jerusalem. But the king says, eh, 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 eh. he can come back, but I don't want to see him. Now, is this forgiveness? You can come back, but I don't want to see you. We can still be friends, but I don't want to talk to you. Can you imagine... If God reacted that way when we screwed up and we said, Lord, I'm sorry, will you please forgive me? And the Lord says, yeah, let me think about it. I might forgive you, but I'm not sure yet. So I need you to go hang out over here in isolation in no man's land while I think about it. That's not how God works. When we confess our sins to him, we are forgiven of our sins. So King David says, no, 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 he can come back, but he needs to go live in his own house. I don't want that guy anywhere near me. David placed restrictions on the crown prince, the future king. He had to remain in his own land, which almost amounted to literally house arrest. He could not come to town. He could not be seen. He had to stay home. Does that all sound familiar? 
stay home, stay safe, right? We are all sequestered to our houses. COVID-19, you can't go outside, stay in your home. Now, I don't know about you, but we have been in our home for three weeks. And the signs of being stuck at home are starting to rear their ugly heads. There's arguments, there's discussion, there's, there's, there's loud voices, there's angry yelling as the kids have just spent way too much time together. Um, being sequestered is not good. We need to get out. It's especially challenging for Absalom because Absalom is very good looking. Absalom is very social. Absalom knows that he's next in line to be king. He wants to get out and he wants to shake hands. He wants to do some politicking. You know it is driving all politicians crazy that they can't go out and shake hands and kiss babies because they want to be politicking right now. But they can't even do that. So Absalom wants to get out of this sequestered situation. Now, perhaps David was testing Absalom to see if he could be trusted, or David may have thought that these restrictions would assure the people that the king wasn't pampering his difficult son. However, these limitations didn't hinder the expansion of Absalom's popularity, for the people loved and praised him. The fact that he had plotted the murder of his half-brother and had proved his guilt by running away meant very little to the people, for people must have their idols. And what better idol than a young, handsome prince? Lack of character was unimportant. What really mattered was status, wealth, and good looks. And in contemporary language, Absalom was a he-man, someone with machismo, macho man. And the people envied and admired him. Times have not changed. Even today, we admire our sports stars, we admire our athletes, we admire, we admire people that should not be admired. They, they cheat on their spouse continually, they cheat on their taxes, they cheat on everybody else. They, we, we allow sinful behavior if you are someone of importance. We look the other direction. We allow it. Oh, you're good looking and you're, you're rich and you're powerful. So you're allowed to be a jerk. Verse 25. In all Israel, there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the top of his head to the sole of his foot, there was no blemish on him. He's beautiful. Now understand, he has blood, bloodlines of kingship on both sides. His grandfather's a king. His mother was the princess. David's a king. They get married. He's a good-looking dude, and he knows it. That's part of the problem. Verse 26, whenever he cut the hair of his head, he used to cut his hair from time to time, and when it became too heavy for him, he would weigh it. Who cuts their hair and weighs it? Well, Absalom, and he would do it once a year. So he had these really thick locks of hair, and it says that when it cut, when he would cut it once a year, it weighed 200 shekels. Now, 200 shekels is five pounds. Five pounds of hair. I want you to think about that. That's a lot of hair. I mean, I wonder, I don't, I don't want to get gross, but how does hair even weigh five pounds? Maybe it's very greasy. It's full of gel. I don't But it is his splendor which is really interesting because in just a few chapters from now, his hair is the reason he dies when it gets caught in a tree and he hangs himself from his beautiful locks. Sometimes isn't it the prized anchors that we hold on to that cause us the most future destruction? For Absalom, it was hair. For other people, it's their business. For other people, it's their relationship, boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever. Don't hold on to prized anchors that pull you down and away from the Lord. Did you know the prized anchor could be a hobby? A prized anchor could be your love of cars, your love of music, your love of whatever keeps you from being with the Lord. And if you have ever skipped church on a Sunday because you wanted to watch the football game or play golf or just sleep, the moment you made that decision, you made that thing more important than your relationship with the Lord Jesus. Did you know that? 
Well, Lee, that's that's being awfully that's being awfully judgmental. If I have a personal relationship with somebody, I want to spend time with them. Well, I don't have to go to church to spend time with them. Well, that's true. And, and just because you don't go to church doesn't mean you go to hell. Simply say, the closer our relationship is with Jesus Christ, the closer we will want to be with him. And where two or three gather together in my name, there am I in the midst, the Bible says. So if two or three people are going to be gathering together and assembling for church, Christ is there. And we should desire to be there as well. Absalom was extolled for his physical appearance. At his annual haircut, it was determined that Absalom's head produced approximately five pounds of hair that had to be cut off. What was considered his crown of splendor will also be his demise. Then Absalom, verse 29, sent for Joab in order to send him to the king, but Joab refused to come to him, so he sent a second time, but he refused to come. Absalom's been sequestered for two years, so he was in Gesher for three years, didn't talk to his dad. Dad brings him back. Now he's been in uh, his hometown near Jerusalem. He's a He's about 14 miles north of Jerusalem in his own place, uh, and it's been two years there. He hasn't seen him. So Absalom says, hey, Joab, I want an audience with my dad. Joab doesn't respond. So he reaches out to him again. He says, Joab, I want to meet with my father. I want to reconcile with my father. I need to get out of being stuck in my home. I want to be able to roam the city, and I want to be the prince. Joab doesn't respond. So Absalom says to his servants, verse 30, he says, look, you see that field over there? That's Joab's field. And he's planted barley. So here's what I want you servants to go do. I want you to go light his fields on fire. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Verse 31, then Joab did go to Absalom's house and he said to him, why have your servant sent my crops on fire? In Judges chapter 15, verse 4, we read the story of Samson. You remember Samson, the very strong man whose strength came from his hair. Uh, he wanted to get the Philistines' attention. So he went out and he caught 300 foxes and he tied them tail to tail in pairs. And then he fastened a torch to the foxes' tails and he sent them running through the fields of the Philistines and all of the Philistines' fields burned. Now, this is the equivalent of going and, and lighting Costco on fire. That's, that's what this is like. Because, or, or pick a grocery store. Wherever you get your food, your sustenance, imagine if somebody lit that on fire. That's probably going to get your attention pretty quickly. So Absalom says to Joab, look, I just want to be with my dad. I want time with my father. Now, if he wants to kill me, let him do it. Verse 32. I sent word to you and said, come here so I can send you to the king to ask, why have I come from Gesher? It would be better for me if I were still there. Now then, I want to see the king's face, and if I'm guilty of anything, let him put me to death. So Absalom is saying, look, I'd rather just be killed than continue to be estranged from my death. Let's have restoration in this relationship. For three years, Absalom was exiled in Gesher. For two years in Jerusalem. Still didn't see his father's face. So Joab gave Absalom's message to David, and David invited his son to come to see him, and the king received him. Verse 33. So Joab went to the king and told him this, and then the king summoned Absalom, and he came in and bowed down with his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. Here we see the seeds of rebellion in Absalom. As an independent and scheming young man, he took matters into his own hands and killed his brother. We saw that in chapter 13. Without his father or anyone else to keep him in check, he probably did whatever he wanted, as evidenced by his setting Job's field on fire. Undoubtedly, his good looks also added to his self-centeredness. Children need discipline, especially those with natural abilities and beauty. Otherwise, like Absalom, they will grow up thinking they can do whatever they want 
whenever they want to do it. David only made half-hearted efforts to correct his children. He did not punish Amnon for his sin against Tamar, nor did he deal decisively with Absalom's murder of Amnon. Such undecisiveness became David's undoing. When we ignore sin, we experience greater pain than if we deal with it immediately. So we have two things that are going on simultaneously here in this chapter. On the one hand, we have the, the results of sinful nature that goes undisciplined. And if you have children that are doing things they need not be doing, as a parent, you need to discipline and correct your children. And I don't care if your kids are 50 years old. If they are living a sinful lifestyle that's not according to the will of God, they need to be corrected. But before you correct them, I would ask you, are you right spiritually with the Lord? Where is your life with Jesus Christ? When your kids look at you, do they see somebody who's in, on fire for Jesus? Or do they see somebody that goes to church on Easter and Christmas? And that's, that's the extent of your relationship with Jesus. You know, we often use God as our 911 when there's problems. And I have a feeling that God's been getting a lot of attention over the last six weeks during coronavirus. Many of you that haven't cried out to God in years suddenly find yourself crying out to God because you don't know now where, where your hope comes from. Can't have hope in the government. They're, they're going to run out of money. Can't have hope in your employer. If, if, the, if the country doesn't open up soon, they might not even be in business. So where does your hope come from? So we have unrepentant, undisciplined sin, and on the other side of this thing, we have an unwillingness to forgive sin. So in closing, reconciliation is made here when David kisses Absalom. Reconciliation is made, but it's too late. For five years, bitterness had been growing in the heart of Absalom. And David was a man who sinned greatly, yet he was forgiven completely. God has forgiven David for his sin with Bathsheba. David's forgiven. Now, he cannot completely forgive his son. He loves him, but he can't forgive him. And he puts conditions on his forgiveness. God, on the other hand, forgives us unconditionally. In Psalm 103.12, we read that as far as the east is from the west, that's how far away your sins and iniquities are. When God forgives, East to west, that's the distance of forgiveness with God. Once you have confessed, your sin is forgiven and forgotten. Yet due to an irrevocable absolute law of nature, the law of sowing and reaping, the results of your sin will crop up indeed, but your father has forgotten them completely. J. Bernard McGee said this, Oh, my friend, our God is a God who forgives. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 tells us, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Consider thyself, lest thou be tempted. It appears that many of us don't read that verse correctly. We think it says, if any man be overtaken in a fault, take a baseball bat and hit him over the head. We are reluctant to forgive, and we can be very mean at times, very unloving and critical. Now, there are times when the truth should be spoken, but when forgiveness is asked for, it should be extended immediately. David made a blunder in not forgiving his son as God had forgiven David, and he will live to regret it. Now, this is fabulous to me. When I go to the Lord and say, Father, I've blown it again. He says, again? I don't recall what you're talking about. God forgave David that way. The problem is, David doesn't forgive his own son with that same unconditional graciousness and forgiveness. This created in Absalom a spirit of bitterness that festered within him for five years. Dad, do you have a son? that feels alienated from you? Mom, do you have a daughter or a son who feels alienated from you? Embrace him or her and say, I forgive you. 
even as I have been forgiven time and time again. You might need to discipline and chasten him, even as our Heavenly Father disciplines us, but you must forgive him or her unconditionally. If you don't, you will find rebellion brewing in their heart. May we be people who forgive the way God forgives. If you have been harboring resentment against someone, ill will, because you've been wronged, forgive and forgive. Life is too short to be overwhelmed by unforgiveness. In the end, it hurts you far more than it hurts the other person. Pray today that the Lord would soften your heart to whomever you have been holding on to negative feelings about and forgive the way you know God forgives you. Let's pray. Lord, we uh, come to you this morning grateful that you have forgiven us. And yet, Lord, humbled because many of us haven't forgiven somebody in our lives. And Lord, I pray for everybody watching and listening and hearing this, that today would be the day that they search deep into their heart, Lord, and they find that person that they have just been feeling negative towards for a really long time. That person hurt them in a, in a difficult and a deep way. Lord, that person violated their trust. That person violated their friendship. That person violated their relationship. And Lord, they are bitter about it. But Lord, today I pray that you would allow those seeds of resentment to go away. Lord, that they would forgive and forget. And allow that person to be fully forgiven. Lord, I thank you that you have forgiven us. I thank you, Lord, that you don't harbor resentment for all of the terrible things we've done. So, Lord, help us to not notice the, the splinter in our brother's eye while we have a plank sticking out of our own. Lord, help us to be people who love. Help us to be people who care. Help us to be people who forgive. And Lord, for the person watching and listening that doesn't have a personal relationship with you this morning, Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they invite you into their heart. And if that's you, if you want to accept Christ this morning, simply say, dear Jesus, I am a sinner. And Lord, I am asking you for forgiveness for all of the terrible things that I've done. Lord, I pray that you would come into my heart and that you'd be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you that when we say that simple prayer, we become born again. We become the adopted sons and daughters of you. And Lord, you forgive us from the east to the west. Never to revisit those terrible things we've done in the past. But Lord, an opportunity to move forward forgiven into the future. What a privilege, what a blessing. Lord, we are so grateful. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, it's always interesting when I sit down to put these sermons together. Because oftentimes what I prepare isn't what gets said. And I don't know who out there right now this morning is experiencing a situation where there's, there's, there's a need to forgive. But the Lord knows who you are. And he wants to encourage you to forgive and forget. If anyone needs prayer, we'd love to pray with you. We have our prayer hotline. You can call us at any time. Uh, that number is 800-461-0216. Again, 800-461-0216. We'd love to pray with you. Uh, you can always visit us at our website at hesusolution.com. Uh, and you can also um, join us every Sunday morning if you'd like to continue our study here in 2 Samuel. Uh, we are here every Sunday, Lord willing, 6.45 a.m. Pacific. Uh, and, of course, also live wherever we are putting events on that particular week. So thank you all for joining us here today. 
Um, for those of you that are here for the workshop, we're going to take a 10 minute break uh, and we will get started at, uh, let's just call it 9-10. Until next time, God bless you guys. Have a great day. Stay safe. We'll talk to you soon. Goodbye, everybody.